Just three years ago, this team had the second worst record in the league, going 19 and 63. So how did a team with no star, no direction, and a bad future with tons of bad draft picks turn into a championship contender overnight? Let's go back, way back, to where it all started. Basketball was originated in America in 1891. Wait, no, not that far back. The mid-2000 Phoenix Suns may be one of the most iconic NBA teams to never win a title. And that is for good reason. Led by two-time MVP Steve Nash and Mike D'Antoni, Phoenix appeared to have a magical orb which could see into the future of basketball. Their playstyle was predicated by fast, 7 seconds or less offense, using a small ball center in Amari Stoudemire and launching threes for what was at the time an unprecedented amount, an overall fast, flashy playstyle drawing in fans every night. And of course, we all know the story. Despite playoff battles against Tim Duncan in the Spurs and Kobe Bryant in the Lakers, the Suns could just never make it work. Despite this Suns team never making the finals, there is a reason why we still talk about the mid 2000s Suns 15 years afterwards. Let's flash forward to the year of our Lord, 2012. After missing out on the playoffs for the last few years, Phoenix knew it was ready to enter the rebuilding process. And sometimes for the good of the team, you have to break a few hearts. ESPN.com's Mark Stein is reporting Steve Nash is joining Kobe Bryant in the LA Lakers backcourt. Steve Nash, the engine of the Suns legendary offense and arguably their greatest player of all time was traded to their all-time rival the team that broke their hearts, the Los Angeles Lakers. And while that Lakers team didn't work out, at that time, they were still expected to rule the NBA. This post Steve Nash era is what I like to call the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages is what you would expect. It's bad. Between 2012 and 2020, Phoenix only had a winning record one time and they failed to make the playoffs every single year. This era was shadowed with plenty of bad or insignificant free agent signings and worst of all, some pretty ugly uniforms. The Suns brought in Luis Scola, Goran Dragic, and Michael Beasley, but Goran Dragic was the only one to be on the team for longer than a year. Unsurprisingly, this team went 25-57. and 57. In the next season, Phoenix's front office continued to underwhelm as the Suns traded for Eric, I don't want to be here Bledsoe. The Suns also drafted Alex Len, they traded Luis Scola for Gerald Green and Mike Plumley, and a draft pick that would later become Bogdan Bogdanovich, who the Suns traded his draft rights before before he ever entered the league. This team did manage to do a bit more, as Eric Bledsoe showed to be a good scorer and distributor, averaging 18 and 5, with Gordon Dragic ballooning up to 20 points per game. This was also during the time where the West was quite stronger than the East, so despite the Suns getting 48 wins, which would have been good enough for the 5th seed in the Eastern Conference, Phoenix still missed out on the playoff. In the 2014-15 season, Phoenix only won 39 games. But, as they saw the success of having both Marcus and Markeith Morris, Phoenix tried to replicate the success by bringing in the brother of Goran Dragic, Zoran Dragic. His two points per game off the bench were less than spectacular, but still better than today's Jared Dudley. Phoenix also signed Tyler Ennis and Eric Bledsoe to long-term deals before trading Ennis before the season was over. The Suns then made a small trade for Isaiah Thomas, get it, small? who scored 15 points per game, but because it was ridiculous having Isaiah Thomas, Goran Dragic, Eric Bledsoe, and our god Zoran Dragic, Phoenix traded nearly all of them away. As part of a three-team trade, the Suns traded the Dragic bros to Miami and returned, they got an elite scorer, someone to build a team around, a reliable player who could score from both the inside and the outside, who was known for legendary battles against LeBron James in the early 2000s. I give you Danny Granger, who never actually played a game with the Phoenix Suns. The Suns, also in response to having too many point guards, traded away Isaiah Thomas for Brandon Knight. Here comes Chris Ball. The lob. Let's go! Oh, what a monster jam by DeAndre Jordan! 
So I think at this point you can notice some trends in the Suns free agents. They would often sign guys for only a year or so and then trade them basically for scraps. Rinse and repeat. Phoenix has basically no free agency drawing so it was difficult for them to bring in anyone over the long term. The season after that, the Suns brought in Tyson Chandler and finished 23-59. and And after all that, all Phoenix did was bring in one, one free agent, and that is Jared Dudley. God damn it, guys. Is it this hard to sign one free agent like Siri? Okay, so free agency was not working for Phoenix. Notice how I didn't mention the draft picks yet? Well, let's talk about that. Out of the 25 players Phoenix drafted since trading Steve Nash, 16 of them are no longer in the league or don't see consistent playing time. The Suns drafted Kendall Marshall, Nemanja Nedovic, Alex Len, TJ Warren, Tyler Ennis, and Bogdan Bogdanovic, and a few other players who never stepped foot on an NBA court. TJ Warren may have been the most successful of the group, so that means the Phoenix Suns traded him away for cash and Bogdan was traded to the Kings before even joining the Suns. Even before Nash was gone and during their peak, Phoenix still sucked at drafting. Luol Deng, Marcin Gortat, Nate Robinson, and Rajon Rondo were all drafted by but then traded by Phoenix before even playing. After drafting Amari Stoudemire in 2002, the next best player the Suns would draft and keep is probably Robin Lopez. So yeah, these guys haven't exactly figured out what the draft is yet, but hey, Maybe Phoenix will finally get it right. Maybe a broken clock is right twice a day. Maybe they can finally draft a player with some potential. With the 13th pick in the 2015 NBA Draft, the Phoenix Suns select Devin Booker from the University of Kentucky. Finally, Phoenix had done it. While Phoenix didn't know it yet, they probably just drafted the third best player to ever put on a Suns uniform. Despite this, Phoenix still struggled, and Booker had an average rookie campaign. This put Phoenix in the number 4 spot of the 2016 NBA Draft. This class was filled with talent like Ben Simmons, Brandon Ingram, Jalen Brown, the next Steph Curry, and the founder of basketball himself, Thon Maker. So with all this talent, what does Phoenix do? With the 4th pick in the 2016 NBA Draft, the Phoenix Suns select Dragon Bender. Are you guys serious? Do you think he was an actual dragon, or do you think that the bootleg Porzingis was going to be your next superstar? Okay, well, maybe I'm being a little harsh on him. After all, Dragon Bender was drafted fourth for a reason, and he has a quite unique playset. So let's see how he can do in his rookie campaign. Yeah, he scored four points per game. Okay, that didn't work out, but Devin Booker is now averaging 22 points per game and a 70? Yeah, a 70 point game at 20 years old. Okay, this guy might be kind of good. So now that we know that we at least have one star, let's pair him with some more young talent in the next draft. With the fourth pick in the 2017 NBA Draft, the Phoenix Suns select Josh Jackson. Okay, here, I don't think I can fault the Suns too much. Jackson was seen as a much better prospect, and most people were happy with the Suns taking him or didn't even see him falling to the fourth spot. He had a solid rookie campaign, but then just never went on from there. The Suns won only 21 games, with Booker continuing to progress as a star. The clock is starting to tick if he's going to remain as a Sun, as this lack of winning is starting to hurt Booker's career. For the first time in their franchise history, the Phoenix Suns landed the number one pick of the NBA Draft. This is it. Anyone they want from a loaded 2018 draft class. They go with the freaky athletic big man, the hometown hero, DeAndre Ayton, and then make a trade for Mikhail Bridges later that night. Okay, finally, we have established a core. While it may have taken 10 years to, and while we aren't able to do too much in free agency, and while we also struck out on two top 5 picks, we finally have a big man and possibly even a wing to complement one of the best scorers in the last decade of the NBA. Despite this, there are still only two highlights from the 2018-19 season. First is the sexiest man alive, Kelly Oubre Jr who the Suns basically stole from the Wizards after only giving them Trevor Ariza. Oubre quickly became a fan favorite on the Suns while instantly increasing his production on the court. 
The other benefit came in DeAndre Ayton. Ayton finished the year averaging 16 and 10 with a block per game. He also finished third in Rookie of the Year voting. It's now 2018. We have a new coach, a new star guard, and a young center where people can't help but calling them the next Shaq and Kobe. Let's see what these guys can do. And they go 19 and 63. Not even Jimmer Fredette can save this team from the suck they endured. It is now the preseason of 2019. Booker, Bridges, and Ayton have had a year to play with each other. Ayton has showed signs of being a promising big man, and Booker shows that he has what it takes to be one of the top guys in the league. Phoenix also traded for Cameron Johnson, signed veteran Ricky Rubio, and re-signed Kelly Oubre. Along with this, they now have a new, new head coach in Monty Williams and had just introduced the Valley. Personally, my favorite home court and uniform may be only second to the Miami Heat. And what happens when we put all this stuff together? It goes well. First game of the season, the Suns defeat the Sacramento Kings. Ayton has 18 and 11, Booker and Oubre both put up 20, and rookie Rubio dishes out 11 assists. An overall strong team game and possibly a sign of future for good things in the Valley. And then DeAndre Ayton gets suspended. 25 games for a banned substance. Without Ayton, the Suns struggle and prove that they just still don't have what it takes. At the All-Star break, they have a record of 22 and 33 before the unthinkable happens. The World Health Organization declared that the coronavirus crisis is now a pandemic. Rudy Gobert has tested positive for the coronavirus. This astounding and unprecedented story continues to evolve. The NBA is suspending the season. And while all of us went into lockdown, the Phoenix Suns got to work. The NBA had resumed their season months later in the bubble in Florida. And while a few of the bottom level teams did not make it, Phoenix was just lucky enough to squeak in there and they took every possible advantage of it. Booker, this is for the win! Got it! Against all odds, the Phoenix Suns went on a legendary run, winning their last eight games, being the only team to go undefeated in the bubble. Like many other players who saw some boosts during this time, Devin Booker put his name on the map with some legendary quarantine performances. The Phoenix Suns had now fought their way all the way to competing for an 8th seed. A team that looked like a lottery team at one point was now just one game away from the playoffs. After going undefeated in the bubble, the Suns were able to sit back and watch their fate be decided between the Brooklyn Nets and the Portland Trailblazers. Portland and Brooklyn had been going back and forth, making it just a one possession game in the final minutes. And after an and one finish by Karis LeVert, the Brooklyn Nets found themselves down seconds. A score here puts the Suns in the playoffs, ends a drought that lasted 10 years. A team that has struggled to bring in free agents, make good draft choices, all of that, all of that crap can be negated by one bucket. Not only is this a chance for Brooklyn to win, but this is a chance for Phoenix to make a historic playoff run. We'll go against McCollum. Down by one, Levert for the lead. No, it's over and Portland survives. A shot that was just mere inches off decided the fate of the Phoenix Suns. But this season was no wash. Despite missing out on the playoffs, the young 8-0 bubble Suns showed that they were something special brewing and that there's just one piece away from putting this all together. Chris Paul is headed to the Phoenix Suns. In a shocking offseason move, the Suns send Kelly Oubre Jr., Ricky Rubio, and a first round draft pick to the OKC Thunder for veteran point guard Chris Paul. Paul coming off of a classic Chris Paul season, leading the Thunder, a team that many thought who were going to be in the lottery, all the way to the playoffs. Now the Suns have to have it together, right? They have their shooting guard. Ayton is coming off of another solid year. Bridges was slowly starting to establish himself as a 3 and D player with the veteran point guard, a brilliant coach, and a team riding the momentum of one of the most unexpected win streaks ever. So what happens when we tip off the season? The Suns actually win their games. Wait, what? The Phoenix Suns are winning games, and they're winning games at an elite rate. At the All-Star break, Phoenix sits 24-11. This is no fluke, as the Suns continue to win, qualify for the playoffs, and earn the number two seed in the Western Conference.
And you hear a very familiar refrain from the fans. In near storybook fashion, the Suns, in their first ever playoff matchup in the last 11 years, the second longest playoff draw in the NBA, face a familiar rival, now with a new legend. And well, I think you know the story from here. Phoenix beats the Lakers in six games where Davis, LeBron, and Chris Paul all suffer injuries. The next round is against the MVP Nikola Jokic and the Denver Nuggets, and well... Now we have found ourselves in the Western Conference Finals, facing another familiar rival. And yep, I think we all know what happens here. Easy inbound with that big body in front of you. Crowd are looking, throws it, alley oh! Aiden puts it down! He puts it down! It's over! So despite that series being a little shaky, the Phoenix Suns have now found themselves in the NBA Finals, and this is where our current story ends. A team that was in a forever age of darkness, stuck with terrible management, drafting, and free agency. A team that was nearly on the brink of greatness last season. A team that missed out on the last 11 playoffs. At the time, the second longest drought in the NBA. A team who hasn't made the finals since his airness went up against his roundness. The Phoenix Suns have shocked the world and are now two games away from winning it all. Do you think Western teams should be concerned, the top teams in the West, about these new look Suns? No, not the top teams. I don't feel that way at all. Well, Steven, that one aged well.